OMG, look at the state of that fag head. Excuse me. Have you seen a zombie anywhere? The UK has a serious drug problem, but the situation is worse than you think. I'm just going to ask you which emergency service you would call. Probably walk away, because I think it's ridiculous. Um, I'm not right sure, if I'm honest, who I would call. In this film, I want to understand why the UK's drug policy of the last 50 years is so regressive. Politicians and newspapers have conditioned us to stigmatise drug users, while thousands die needlessly every year in Britain. When did we start treating addicts with contempt instead of compassion? I don't support decriminalisation. Absolutely no plans to legalise cannabis. Those unwilling to address their drug misuse, they'll be the harshest possible legal sanctions. I'll go to Portugal to investigate whether decriminalisation could work in Britain. The big packet is good press. This is rocket is the best. It has not been more than five minutes, and I've bought one and a half grams of cocaine in central Lisbon. I think the, the biggest problem about drug policy is that it's a danger zone for politicians. If you actually want to do something, Everyone agrees that it should be dealt as an healthcare issue. And I'll speak to a mother whose daughter's death could have been prevented. Had Martha been around when there was a more progressive drug policy in place, that half a gram of white powder could probably have been tested. There's no doubt in my mind that the war on drugs killed my daughter. Martha's death was a very modern death because it's all her social media still there. Martha was 15, she was my only child, so we were very close. She was and a very extraordinary person, big-hearted, caring. She was not perfect, but she was my imperfect little teenager. This haunts me a bit, not just because it doesn't have an apostrophe there, <laughs> <laughs> but because she was dead three weeks later and she's saying everything that you need to understand about a teenager. I mean, she's saying it in a, such a powerful way. Yeah, and when I found this, I, I started taking it round to talk to other teenagers and saw their reaction to it. So this tweet has become really a very powerful symbol of what happened to Martha and the kind of voice that she had. A teenaged girl has died in Hinksy Park in Oxford. Police investigating her death are informing her next of kin. A number flashed up on my mobile phone that I didn't recognise. And a woman said, your daughter's gravely ill and we're trying to save her life. It was a, a lovely July morning. She goes down an alleyway and she has... It's a crystalline version of MDMA, which she pounded into a white powder. And it was a half a gram. And it was 91% pure, so incredibly strong. So in the UK, at that moment in time, the average potency of MDMA was about 47%. Do you think in a more tightly regulated market where users are aware of the strength and recommended dose of something, that she would be alive today? Something that kind of haunts me is, I mean, this is maybe the fourth time Martha had taken ecstasy ever. I sort of pulled her up, expecting her to deny it. And I was so shocked that she told me the truth that I was kind of, I didn't quite know what to say because she told me the truth. <laughs> And I, was, I just blurted out, those pills could contain rat poison. I realised that she went off to do some research to find the pure version, so it wouldn't be mixed with rat poison. And what she didn't know was the difference between poison and medicine is, is dose. Even if Martha had inadvertently got her hands on something, like a box of something, she could have read the label and gone, OK, I'll take a half or whatever. Mm -hmm. But not enough for five to ten people in one go. The only thing I got back from the police a couple of weeks later in her school bag were those shoes. You know, Martha goes out on a Saturday and her shoes come back and that's it. And I'm get, I have to go on with my life now. Just want to get an ice cream. <laughs> Super whipping. And a single marshmallow, please. Had Martha been around when there was a more progressive drug policy in place. That half a gram of white powder could probably have been tested. There's no doubt in my mind that the war on drugs killed my daughter. Absolutely, no doubt. I was actually somewhat inspired by meeting Anne-Marie. Her experience is an incredibly traumatic one. Young people are dying. There are ways to stop them from dying. 
and I'm sad that her death was preventable. There are alternative models, and if they were in place in the UK, Martha didn't need to die. Are you having to say that because he's sitting right next to you, Mr. Malthouse? Is it, is it slightly No, I don't know. I have no awkward. idea where he is. There he is. I have no idea where he is. There he is. This is Kit Malthouse. He's the government minister responsible for crime and policing, but unfortunately, he's not known for his attention to detail. So, I thought I'd do some research on his behalf. Where to start? If only there was a way to search for it on the internet. Turns out, drugs have been decriminalised in Portugal for more than 20 years. Maybe the thought of a three-hour trip on a budget airline has delayed any prospective fact-finding mission. But I'm not averse to a 6am airport pint and arguing with an air hostess about hand luggage. So I headed to Lisbon to see, firsthand, the health-based approach that might have saved Martha's life. And it wasn't long before I encountered its consequences. A big packet to use a good price. This is rocket, is the best. Test, no problem. Test here, my friend. Problem for me, I have too much. It's, I mean, it's definitely something, because my lips are tingling. As I put in my pin, I wondered whether decriminalisation made anyone safer or just made it easier to get high. So it has not been more than five minutes. I mean, it's pretty close to two, and I've bought one and a half grams of cocaine. We're in the main square, just around the corner here. It's incredibly easy. Like, it felt bizarrely relaxed. There's small, small kids playing, families, police. Yeah, it was really chilled out. It looks like a gram and a half of cocaine, but it also looks like a gram and a half of baking soda. So I don't know what it is, in truth. I, I really don't. And there's only one way to find out. We are going back to the hotel where I have a chemical reagent testing kit, the finest the internet can offer. What I felt like going into that situation was that we were being conned, that in, in some way, whether it was what we were actually being sold, or, um, maybe that's just because of how unusual it is to have it be so blatant, so open and so easy. That uh, dab I took earlier, I, was, I put far too much <laughs> on my hand and my whole mouth went numb. Portugal was not the first country to decriminalise some or all of their drugs. But what you do need to know is that it has been incredibly successful. A heroin epidemic prompted a health-led approach in 2001, and since then, drug-related deaths have remained below the EU average. But it seems, here in Britain, we're still stuck in the Stone Age, despite... Have you snorted cocaine? <laughs> How many times did you take cocaine? I took it several occasions. Have you ever taken illegal drugs? Oh. We'd been warned that tourists were often targeted with crushed up paracetamol. As we arrived back at the hotel, it was time to test the mysterious white powder. This is uh, a reagent test. So in each of these little vials, there's a different chemical. So this can test for cocaine, diphenhydramine, dox, utilone, heroin, ibuprofen, ketamine. Open the reagent bottle and get a generous scoop. You should fully cover the substance from air. Observe the first colour change only. The reaction will take up to three minutes. Oh, you can see the colour reaction happening already. See how it's changed colour? Yeah, it's cocaine. I'm kind of surprised, to be honest with you. I thought, I was expecting we'd kind of been, uh, yeah, like I said, fleeced, conned in some way. And I would assume that having hard drugs like this, this readily available, would lead to more people taking them. But that's not what the statistics in Portugal show. So, turns out it wasn't bicarb after all. And I was in possession of a gram and a half of cocaine, an empty hotel room, and a real dilemma on my hands. I handed myself in at the nearest police station. Yesterday, I bought some drugs. Am I under arrest? If you get, uh, they catch you to, to buying. Yeah. So no, if you have the drug, depends of the, the quantities. Mm -hmm. If uh, you have uh, quantities just for two, 10 days, the authorities see you like a consumer. Our focus is about the traffickers, the dealers, the combating the, the traffic, not the, the consumers. So yesterday, we were in the town center filming and there's a lot of drug dealers approaching tourists like myself, offering to sell drugs. 
What do you think of that as a policeman? You, you, you must not like it. What's your well, view? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a police officer. 2001 of July, the consumers are uh, just a consumer and they uh, make an administrative offence. We treat them like a, a consumer and a heel. Like a, a police officer, I, I need to, to work with uh, the, the law. It was really interesting uh, to meet Rui and meet someone who has compassion for drug users. I think that's the, the most glaring, the obvious difference here, um, that drug users are treated with compassion. The Portuguese police work hand in hand with medical staff to treat drug users. So the next stop on my journey was with Hugo, a psychologist who tours Lisbon dispensing heroin substitute methadone in broad daylight. So where are we going, Hugo? We are now going to, to a stop which is in the middle of Lisbon, one of the stops of the Low Threshold Methadone Program. At a white van on a busy road, people queued up to get their medicine. It was a clear example of a more transparent and informed drug policy. Patients collecting their prescription from doctors. But with Britain in mind, I knew not everyone would see it that way. The accusation people will level at you is that this service is enabling drug use, that you are encouraging drug use. How do you respond to that accusation? Well, for, for me, it doesn't make sense. So the, here, what we are doing here, it's to fa face a problem. So there, there are some heroin users. People need to do their regular life. People need to do the medication, daily medication, and people have the medication and do a normal life. This doesn't enable to use drugs or to use more methadone. Uh, to, to by having it for free. There are a lot of addictions in our, our world, but uh, in fact, drug use, uh, well, because of many times it's related to crime and uh, it's more penalized because of that. But if we look back and look at the drug use as an addiction, we have to understand what is an addiction. And it's very complex to ask someone to stop using drugs in the right moment or uh, under the condition that the doctors want to uh, if you don't, do not understand what is going on with the, the patient. I wondered whether a scheme like this actually saves lives until I spoke to Paul. He credits the work of Hugo and his team as the sole reason he is still alive today. This program saved, literally saved my life. And it saves lives. And I think everybody, every country should get involved the world should get involved because in your country, there are a lot of people dying in your country because of this epidemic. Okay, here in Portugal, you know, I think that if you look at the numbers, it kind of dropped. Yeah. You know? You think it's, you think it's obvious this, this is proven, it demonstrates, it works? Of course it works. Of course it works. Definitely it works. It works for me. You know, it works for me. I, I don't do drugs, I don't touch drugs. Late last year, I visited Scotland. People are coming here and injecting in the conditions that are really unsterile. A country blighted with a drug death crisis comparable to Portugal's in the 90s. I couldn't help but feel that a service like this would prevent people from dying in their thousands back home. The difference between this service we're seeing here in Lisbon and what we saw in Glasgow, they're, they're worlds apart. And it might sound unusual to say this, but being here watching this van, it's actually quite infusing. I feel optimistic seeing this. It's, it's compassionate. It's, 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 quite, it's quite inspirational, actually. I'd seen what Portugal's drug policy looks like on the ground, but I also wanted to understand how it happened and why other countries aren't trying to replicate its successes, potentially saving the lives of people like Martha. So I met up with one of its architects, sociologist Nuno Capage. The biggest problem about drug policy is that it's a danger zone for politicians. Just simple as that. There's a, a really good chance that you're going to lose votes in the next election if you do anything regarding drug policy. What we did in, Port in Portugal back in the 90s and the late 90s, 2000s, was because we decided to deal with it as an health issue, it was all very technical we were able to remove the politics out of the policy. And that's, that's key to address this sort of situation because it's so complex, it messes with so many, it's, it's a puzzle so big with so many pieces 
that you need to you need to address it uh, uh, extensively in order to finish the puzzle. So a big part of that philosophy, as I understand it, in treating these people as in need of healthcare treatment is also compassion. The change from the criminal mindset to the medical mindset, it's key to, to, to get a proper drug policy and to get good results from your drug policy. And normally, when you go to a health service, normally compassion is one of the factors involved in the, in the procedures, right? I, I've seen over the years a lot of people starting to wave the flag of the uh, deal with it as an healthcare issue and so on. But then you know, when you see the people that are deciding it, are mostly lawyers, police officers, judges, and that's what I say normally, well, get a medical doctor there, get the psychologist, get the sociologist. Drug-related issues are so complex that it's not going to be just one person that it's going to see all the different angles and get all the different answers or possibilities of answers for that same question. But does the UK only see drug users as a problem? To test the scale of the problem, I'm on the Great British High Street to play a game of 999, what's your emergency? I show members of the public a photo of an emergency. They tell me which emergency service they would call. Oh, fire brigade. Fire service. Fire department. Yep, probably ambulance. Start them first if they've called ambulance. Mm -hmm. That's an ambulance situation. I might say call the police or whatever, yeah. Probably walk away because I think it's ridiculous. Hard, isn't it? That's a tough one. Um, I'm not right sure if I'm honest. Yeah, that might be a medical emergency if the person overdoses. Yeah. But this person's a criminal. This is someone injecting drugs on the street. Which might lead to an overdose situation, and therefore you need an ambulance. You just have to ask if after they say to you, this person is dangerous to me, I need to call the police, ask them, what if it's your brother? Or what if it's your neighbor? And they will probably change their stance a little bit because it's not a them or a situation again. It's a, a situation. And if you, wanna, if you actually want to do something about the issue, everyone agrees that it should be dealt as an healthcare issue. And that's easy. That's easy. My time in Portugal was over. I'd seen how a society had rejected prohibition and its health-led approach was saving countless lives and could have saved Anne-Marie's daughter, Martha. Armed with all this information, I couldn't wait to share what I'd learned with Minister Malthouse, or better yet, Pretty Patel. All they'd have to do was watch our film. prohibition ever does is create a black market so why are we just allowing that to be the norm because we know it's never worked so why we're keeping using it thinking at some point it will work 50 years is enough it's alarming not what's not being done it's alarming i think it should be treated like a national emergency i made a promise that i wouldn't get a gravestone until something changes with uk drug policy because when i carve or get those words carved into her gravestone at least I'll know that her death will mattered in some way and that she has this kind of amazing legacy. Yeah. <laughs>